Well, hello, this is Adam, and welcome to Rare Classic Cars. Today, I thought I would treat you to a discussion about Chrysler's RB or raised block wedge V8 engine, the 440. And of course, there are a number of different variants of the RB wedge V8, including the 383, the 426 wedge, and then of course the 440. And this RB series engine was very similar to the B series engine, which included a lot of different displacements, 350 cubic inches, 361 cubic inches, but the deck heights were different. The deck height on the B series was just under 10 inches, and on the RB, I believe it was about 10.75-ish, I want to say, in that zip code. But regardless, the 440 was probably the, well, one of the best of these RB series V8s, and certainly one of the ones that was most recognizable, and it was Chrysler's largest V8 that it put in passenger cars, for quite some time, produced from 1965 through 1978. And there's a lot of great things about this 440. Let's pop the hood and we'll talk a little bit more about it. All right, so here we are under hood, and this is a 1972 New Yorker. And by this time, the 440 was losing a bit of its power. 1972 was also the first year that automakers switched over to the net horsepower ratings, which included the ratings uh, of the engine with things like the air cleaner as well as the exhaust and all the accessory drives. Prior to that, the horsepower ratings were on a gross basis and did not include that. So that's one of the reasons why you see a significant horsepower drop off on vehicles after the 1971 model year. The second is that the compression ratios tend to be lower as well because these cars are starting to, in effect, get ready for unleaded gasoline and, well, they also have to deal with emissions regulations by this point. So this 440 under hood made 335 gross horsepower or 225 net horsepower in single exhaust form. I put factory exhaust, dual exhaust on mine. So it's probably making around 240-ish net horsepower in that zip code. But the 440 came in so many different combinations. You could get, of course, at the top of the line, the 440 six-pack with three two-barrel carburetors that made around 390 horsepower. You could get a 375 horsepower 440. That was kind of the standard higher performance version of the 440 in the late 60s and early 1970s before the horsepower ratings were revised. And just an overall stout, stout engine, particularly through the 1972 model year. In 1973, they would get rid of some of the forged internals and it kind of made sense probably because by this point this was not a high rpm engine this was really a lower rpm engine and i don't think anybody really noticed a difference one of the things that chrysler did do during this time frame was frankly build really great engines it's hard to think of over the course of history bad chrysler engines you know four six eight cylinder you certainly can pick on some that they put in cars like the Mitsubishi 2.6 liter four cylinder. Maybe you pick a little bit on some of the early 2.2 liter overhead cam four cylinders and the K cars early in their life. But, you know, by and large, I would say Chrysler often had their engines really sorted out well. Now, they did have some Achilles heels associated with them that maybe would make owners of them not agree with me. The first is that white little box there which is the ballast resistor which tended to fail on humid days and that would cause a I'll call it a condition where the engine would start but then it would instantly die so if you have any Chryslers those parts do go out relatively often I recommend keeping a spare in your glove box because all you have to do is just unhook those wires there on the ballast resistor hook the new one in. Of course, it's secured there to the firewall by one screw, but if in a pinch you can just hook one up and then get yourself off the road and finish, uh, finish the job, if you will. So that was one thing that wasn't a great robust piece on these. The other is this early electronic ignition box that you see here. This was optional equipment on most of the 72s. I believe it became standard in 1973. And this is the original box on this car still. It still has the Chrysler logo, but that wasn't an overly robust piece on here, I would say, either. 
The third thing is that when these Chryslers came from the factory, they came with factory champion or Presto Light spark plugs often. And the spark plugs that came in these, I got to be honest, were just junk. And the combination of the spark plugs and this ignition setup really made the cars hard starting in some cases in cold or wet weather in particular. And the best thing that you can do on these is to change out your champion plugs. I would never use champion plugs in anything. And believe it or not, in my Chrysler and actually all my cars, I run AC Delco standard plugs. And I've never had an issue. And they run beautifully. This car starts instantly uh, warm, cold. Obviously, if it's been sitting for a few weeks or something, you got to crank it a little bit. But the spark on it's great. The engine runs extremely smoothly. Uh, as I'll show you in a minute. So the 440, as I said, was around from 1965 to 1978. Unfortunately, in the latter years, it would get the so-called Chrysler Lean Burn. And you may have seen the air cleaner decal there. It says Lean Burn on some of the Chryslers from the late 70s, mid 70s even. And that was a setup that had an electronic thermoquad carburetor Carter thermoquad carburetor with a plastic uh, fuel bowl to try to alleviate vapor lock. And it had all sorts of sensors, a throttle position sensor, um, and there's a little computer on the air cleaners over here that will control the spark advance. And those cars feel quite boggy unless you've been driving them on the freeway for some time. And then you get off the freeway because the timing only advances if you have your foot on the accelerator pedal for an extended period of time. I believe it's every 30 seconds the computer will command more spark advance and that way if you're on a long trip on the freeway you kind of get optimum spark advance. But if you're around town just going from stoplight to stoplight you don't have that much spark advance and that was done for emissions. More spark advance created more emissions and that's why that setup came about. And it was true to form. It was lean burn. I believe the stoichiometric ratio or the uh, air fuel ratio on those vehicles was around 18, 18 and a half to one. And optimum is around 14.7 to one. So they did run lean. And again, that was done for emissions. But in any case, the 440 is just an excellent, excellent Chrysler V8. Unfortunately, you have those issues that I was mentioning. And I'll say the other one is tune-ups on some of these uh, you know it looks easy there's tons of apparently tons of room in this engine bay it's not fun and mechanics back in the day really I've had some people tell me that the mechanics would kind of draw straws in effect for who would do the Chrysler tune-ups because little old ladies would come in having driven these cars in the hot weather with the air conditioning on and just tons of underhood heat, these manifolds, super hot, and want a tune-up and want it done quickly. And it's not a car you can do quickly. I've changed all the plugs in this car. I did it from the bottom. It was not a fun job. I don't think you could be successful doing it at, uh, from the top unless you know you're really quite dexterous, especially in this area with the uh, steering gear here in the way. So it's a little bit challenging. It's not horrible compared to day, today's cars, but more challenging than other vehicles. I'll say this is the hardest car to tune up of any that I own of these classics, just changing the spark plugs. But the results are rewarding. So let's see. Oh yeah. Let's see what it's like and start it up. And you can hear how smooth it is. Look at that. No ticks, no knocks. Nothing. Just smooth 440 power and a great exhaust note too. So one of Chrysler's 
great V8s. By the way, all the R-Block engines have the same bore as well. I'm sorry, have the same stroke. Their differentiating feature is the bore. So kind of an interesting approach to engine design, but one that worked well for Chrysler. And I'll just tell you, if you get any of these Chryslers with a 440 underhood, even by this point, 1972, they're still an enjoyable drive. They're super torque monsters, tons of power to get out of the way. And well, you heard the starter there a little bit, but this car starts so quickly and some of you want to hear that Mopar gear reduction starter that I got a little treat for you now that you can hear this car crank a little bit more. Before, now it's warm, I let it crank a little bit while it was still cold and I didn't set the choke just so that you could purposely hear the starter a little bit more. So let's take a listen to that now. All right, well now here's something fun for those of you who love Mopars. And for those of you who aren't aware, the gear reduction starter on these Chryslers just has the funniest sound. If you ever listen to a movie from uh, the 60s, 70s, 80s, even up and through the 90s, I want to say, or a TV show, particularly those who were produced by Universal, they'd use the Chrysler starter noise for everything. And I guess because it's distinctive, but you definitely knew it was a Chrysler starter if you ever owned one of these cars. So... Here you go. I'm not going to set the choke. This car hasn't been started in a while and the engine's cold and it's relatively cold outside. I'm purposely doing that so it's going to crank a little bit and you can hear the sound of the starter. So here you go. You ready? And they always have that, I don't know, the, the wind down of the starter too is another typical Chrysler trait. But that's what it sounds like. And ooh, there's a cold light even. Can you see that? There we go. It says cold right there. So here you go again. Now watch this car. will start right up probably. Here we go. There's your famous Chrysler gear reduction starter on this Mopar 440.